In today's show, let's talk about how the Trailblazers can maximize Damian Lillard, whether tanking is in the cards, and what's next for the Blazers as they enter a road-heavy January. Welcome to Lockdown Blazers. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Trailblazers, your daily Portland Trailblazers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, world? It's your past first point guard and Trailblazers reporter, Mike Richmond. You're listening to another episode of Locked On Blazers, part of Locked On Podcast Network, available wherever you get podcasts, now also on YouTube. If you haven't subscribed to the show on YouTube yet, do me a favor. It's also available wherever you get podcasts. Tell a friend, help us grow the show. In today's episode, I want to talk a little bit about maximizing Damian Lode with the Trailblazers. What does this team have to do from sort of the midpoint or approaching the midpoint of the season into the next couple of years to get the most out of prime Damian Lillard? Uh, and then we want to talk about the road heavy January ahead. Um, the Blazers played a basketball game on Friday. They lost very shorthanded loss to the Lakers. Uh, happy birthday, LeBron James or whatever. But instead of spending time on another blowout loss to, with a shorthanded team and, and, and all those frustrations. Let's zoom out a bunch in this episode. Um, I want to talk sort of about the present and the future of the Blazers through the lens of of what of their best player, because like so many teams in the league, their their best players kind of um, their best player sort of defines the direction that they're going to go in. And then we'll close the show. Um, Blazers play a bunch of road games, to close out January and head into the second half of the season. And uh, it's, it's going to be a tough stretch. So instead of sort of looking at, at some more struggles, uh, let's let's zoom out as much as we can in this episode. Uh, first, Friday show, uh, Jason Quick joined the, joined the program. We talked sort of about, um, you know, State of the Blazers and, and, and Damian Lowe's um, fr- frustrations with like quick specifically, but in, in that show, Jason said that he, you know, some of the frustrations are, are built around Jason's idea. And he said it here. And I'm, frankly, I, I don't think it's that offensive, but like that the Blazers should consider trading Damian Lord, not like they should trade him that like this team is in a space where everything should be on the table, including trading the franchise cornerstone instead of sort of relitigating whether that's offensive or not. I don't find it. I don't find that opinion to be particularly offensive, but Instead of sort of relitigating that debate, uh, I want to correct one thing that I didn't push back on and um, uh, and should have in that episode. Uh, Quick likened it to the DeMar DeRozan situation with the Toronto Raptors, in which the Raptors, you know, had this pretty good team and they were they needed, you know, they had a chance to take a risk and they trade away DeMar DeRozan and then got Kawhi Leonard and made a championship run. And that is in spirit of what DeMar DeRozan meant to the Raptors. You know, he's like the third greatest Raptor of all time or something no worse than fourth, right? Uh, And for my money, third. Um, For what he meant to the Raptors, it's more maybe akin to to Dame or more of like sort of spiritually connected to the the Damian Lillard situation in Portland. But it's much, much more similar, in my opinion, to when the Oklahoma City Thunder traded Paul George. Because when you traded DeMar DeRozan for Kawhi Leonard, you were taking one last shot at a championship. If the Blazers were to trade Damian Lillard, they would be signaling a rebuild. It is much more Paul George where you're trading for a bunch of picks and hoping that Shea Gilgis Alexander pops and turns into a star. Like that's the package you're trading for. And I didn't push back on that against Quick. At the time, I was kind of like, yeah, okay. But it, that's my bad. That, that that was something that in the moment I didn't totally, I wasn't totally on board with, but I did not do a bad job. I did not do my job as host of saying, hold on, let's, let's put this in context. Now I've had a couple days um, and a cross-country flight to, uh, to sort of think about that. And, and I think the, the context here is sort of like um, trading Dame would signal a rebuild, would signal this massive rebuild, a massive you know four or five year start over period. And nobody wants that. Damon Lord doesn't want it and the Trailblazers don't want it. So instead of, you know, I think actually quite frankly, Several listeners have sent me the what if they traded Dame question in the mailbag, and I've, I've just kicked it down the road. I'm saving it for another time because um, not only we're not there, like I'm not in favor of doing that, and I'll lay that out here in this episode, but like the, the team doesn't want to do it. So I think it's more pertinent. That's what I want to do in this episode. And so while I've spent a little time here setting the stage, it's like talk about they're going to keep Dame and Dame wants to be here, both, both, both team and friend and, and player. And quite frankly, from what I've learned on the internet, a lot of fans, they deeply united in, in keeping, keeping this thing intact and, and sort of rebuilding, retooling around Damian Lord. Of course, that means talking about trading other players and where do, where do we draw the line? I guess is my question. Um, but 
nobody wants to trade Dame at this juncture. Dame doesn't want to be traded. The team doesn't want to trade him. So the question then becomes, how do you maximize Damian Lillard? How do you get the best out of what you have? And Dame has been hurt this year and he has not been one of the 10 best players in the league, but I am under the impression that if he were to get healthy and that could happen, you know, next season, that he could still be one of the very, very good players in the league and give you a puncher's chance for the next two to three seasons. So the question then becomes, what do you do for the next two or three seasons to get there? And sort of the, 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 the thinking behind this is that like the way that the Blazers have, operated for six years is they've tried one thing. And uh, I'm going to do a lot of sort of citing my sources in this episode. I've got my, I got my notes here and I, I want to make sure that people get credit for their ideas um, that I am aggregating for lack of a better term. Um, Tom Ziller, who writes the basketball uh, newsletter, Good Morning, It's Basketball, fantastic, uh, strong recommend. Uh, Ziller is just a, a wonderful voice and will make you smarter and, and more thoughtful about the game in the way that um, so few do, and he's been doing it for such a long time that it's 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 truly a truly a wonderful newsletter. Good morning, it's basketball available on Substack. But what Zilla wrote is that the Blazers really haven't tried anything else. They've tried this: pair Dame and CJ and fix around the edges, and that hasn't worked. And I think we're we're at a point where we realize that sort of that experiment has kind of run its course. So then the question isn't like, what can you get from Dame and CJ? You know. You, you trade for Norm, you trade for Larry Nance, you trade for Robert Covington, you make, you know, you, you make the use of Nurkic trade to kind of get the anchor. Like they've built this, they've built the tweaks around the edges experiment for four or five seasons. It's time to move beyond that. But I don't think moving, like the whole thesis of this, the whole point of this episode is not to move beyond without Dame. It's to say like, Dame's here. The most important thing that you have when you're building a really good basketball team is one of the, one of the top players in the league, like top end talent really matters. The Blazers have that. How do they maximize that? So in, in sort of using Ziller's idea that like, try anything else, you know, you tried LaMarcus and Dame pretty darn good. You tried Dame and CJ pretty darn good, but, to, but they really haven't given it like another thing. What do those other things look like? And for the next two to three seasons, how can the Blazers maximize the Damian Lord at the peak of his powers, or at least darn close to the peak of his powers? And, and whatever darn close is for my money over the next, like I said, two to three years, you have one of the truly very, the truly great players in the league. That's step one to building a team that can compete and be competitive every night. Then you move forward from there. So let's talk about in the second segment, what those next steps mean, recognizing the Blazers challenges, putting it in context, and all of those things. How do you maximize this team with Damian Lillard on the roster? That's what we'll do in the second segment. But first, I want to tell you all about Bill Barr. It's a new year. It's the same old built bars. Whether your resolution is to eat more delicious protein bars or something more elaborate, the place you want to go is to built.com. Listen, Built Bars, they taste great and they're good for you. Most Built Bars, 130 calories, four grams of sugar, four grams of net carbs. Pretty simple, 17 grams of protein packed in there. That's your typical Built Bar. Coming in a whole bunch of delicious flavors like mint brownie, salted caramel, cookies and cream, peanut butter brownie, my personal favorite, or raspberry if you're into the more fruity types. They're covered in 100% chocolate. They got something for everybody's palate. So start off the new year right by eating delicious protein bars. Go to built.com, use the promo code LOCK15. You get 15% off your order. That is promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at built.com. All right. So we talked, we're talking Damien Lord. How the Blazers can maximize this window. Um, I said I was going to cite my sources a lot here. I'm going to cite, I'm going to cite, uh, Danny Morang here, who, who came up with this idea on Twitter, host of the uh, Jack Ramsey's podcast. It might just be Jack Ramsey's. I'm always bad with this. Is it, do we need an article the Jack Ramsey's podcast or is it just Jack Ramsey's or is it Jack Ramsey's podcast? I don't know. Anyways, Danny Morang has pointed out several times over, um, in, through many, many tweets, I'm citing his tweets here, um, that the Blazers sort of, if they're going to, if you're building a roster around Dame, the things that you need are length, and athleticism, like those are the key traits to sort of complement Dame. You're going to want shooting in there too, for sure. But the length and the athleticism are, are what, what's valuable. And the Blazers just haven't done that very often. They don't have that sort of big, big vertical spacer at center to kind of, um, you know, be a lob thread and create, create like real downhill, um, scare people moving downhill towards the rim because, you know, you can just like throw it up and go get it to some extent. They don't have great, great athletes on the perimeter. You know, Robert Covington is slow. Larry Nance is like athletic for his size. 
size, but you wouldn't you wouldn't describe him as a freak athlete at this point in his career. Norman Powell, strong and fast and quick, but again, not like sort of in that echelon of crazy, crazy athletes. The only person who's like in the sort of upper echelon of athletes is Nazir Little, and he isn't as skilled as as those other guys. So it's hard to um sort of it's hard to build a Damon Nas super team just yet. Um, but but using those parameters uh, that, that Danny has laid out for us is that you, you sort of need that length and athleticism. You kind of start thinking about how to maximize Dame's window. But I think there's some, there, there's some obvious caveats here. Like how do you maximize what you get out of Dame is those are the traits you need, but can you acquire those traits and, and enough, you know, high level skill to be a really competitive team with what you have to trade away? And it, increasingly, I think it's challenging. I don't think the Ben Simmons thing is going to happen. Um, it certainly could, you know, the, the trade deadline could, could sort of force Philly's hand um, and, and they could be in that, they could be in a position where they're sort of more desperate because they don't want to, um, you know, they don't want to waste quote unquote, a year of Joel Embiid's prime. Does that sound familiar to you, dear Blazers fans? But it's kind of, it seems like the, the Simmons for CJ swap has been there and Philly wanted to do it. It would be done, but deadline spur action. So we'll wait and see, but I think that's relatively unlikely. I think a deal for Pascal Siakam, another name often sort of bandied about would be, is relatively unlikely, but that's size, that's length, that's athleticism. That's the type of player you need. Um, I would probably throw Jalen Brown in that mix. Uh, the Celtics might end up breaking up the Jays and blowing it up, but I don't see them wanting what the Blazers have to offer. If the Blazers get involved for any of those three gentlemen, sort of the, the top of the wish list is where we're sort of organizing these. It's like they're going to be involved in, in, in a three team type trade. So I don't think, you know, even if you take a step down from those, the top of the wish list, I don't think there's a clear straight across trade for Jeremy Grant that, um, that, that Detroit would be super interested in Detroit taking on, you know, two years and, and, um, $65 million of CJ McCollum money probably doesn't appeal to them too, too much. Although with the right sweeteners, you could get it done. Is Damon Lord and Jeremy Grant a duo that could win a championship? No, but length, athleticism, you're getting, you're, you're checking more of the boxes for how you uh, work around Dame. And like, and like Ziller said, it's time to try something new. It's worth giving a shot with this top end talent to try another shape. And I think that matters. As, as you sort of move down this list though, as you're saying like, okay, well, they need wings, they need athletes, where do you go? I think there's some sort of un, unsexy names and I don't, I think this is length and not athleticism, but like Gordon Hayward, um, a, a guy who can score and is skilled and is six foot eight and is, can play three and four, um, is probably guards fours, but is a three type of thing. Um, not a perfect fit next to Dame, some defensive liabilities, some consistency, some sort of like just needs to shoot a lot and doesn't make um, his teammates necessarily better as a great passer. But again, size, a different shape, all these things. I'm not, a, I'm not advocating for Gordon Hayward, but at least add him to the list. I think you add Harrison Barnes to the list. Uh, listener Owen has, has proposed several times as some sort of trade involving Karis LeVert and TJ Warren. Um, I, I don't love that trade, but yeah, this is, that's, you know, more length, more size with 6'6", six, six, uh, Karis LeVert, and, and eventually if TJ Warren ever gets back, and wouldn't that be great? One of the great scorers in the league when he was healthy last two years ago, um, you know, 6'8", six, 6'9", six, and, and, and can really get a bucket. A name I throw to the list is Jonathan Isaac. I uh, don't know if the, if the Magic would trade Jonathan Isaac, but, uh, you know, profiles as, as probably at the sort of top of his game. Um, as like an all NBA type, like a, one of the best wing defenders in the league. Like it's, it's a short list of guys who both like sort of make the right amount of money and could be had for those types of deals. Like we're talking about trading CJ McCollum to make these upgrades because that's who the Blazers have to trade. If they don't trade CJ McCollum, you're talking about the most tradable parts being Robert Covington and Yusuf Nurkic. How, how do you make that work? Like, how do you trade, um, Nurk and Rocco, and instead of like going through sort of names a la trade machines I've done with sort of the CJ type targets, I just, I'll just say this, you're talking about more about just like shifting the look. So something like Robert Covington for Kelly Oubre, Kelly Oubre for my money is worse than Robert Covington, but um, you know, younger has been, has been playing really well in Charlotte and maybe just like a little more jolt of athleticism changes up the Blazers calculation. Sometimes just moving around the deck chairs, changing, changing the laundry or whatever can, um, can get you sort of can push you there but again that's the, with the idea that try something new and that you need length and athleticism you can see that the list is relatively short and 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 pretty challenging which gets us to the idea proposed by listener scott who says perhaps the best path forward 
is just being not very good this year and going into the into the summer with CJ McCollum still on the roster and with um a lottery pick in hand and trying to make trades at that point. And and where I have landed as I've gone through this exercise is that I think you make the calls. I think you I think you absolutely make the calls and you try to trade CJ McCollum for if not someone on this list and, and maybe you get in a three team deal. Uh, listener Kevin Dew sent in shout out to Courtside Kev sends in the idea of a sort of a a Nurk a Miles Turner package where. Um, Nurk ends up in in Charlotte because they need an upgrade at center, and Charlotte sends uh, PJ Washington and spare parts to Indiana, um, and Indiana ships out uh, sends out Miles Turner. Here would involve Robert Covington and Nurk, like but creative three team trade, right? We're like the team that needs an upgrade at center is Charlotte. Uh, Indiana doesn't need a center. Like we're talking, this is the creativity. So um, I think that's kind of the ballpark you're in for if you're going to tra- do like a Nurk and Rocco type of swap, that's that's the direction you're going to be in because straight across for either of those two gentlemen um, isn't going to be super, super easy. But I think you can get creative, like I said. But but I think listener Scott's idea that maybe, and I'm, I'm, sorting, I'm starting to lean here, is that maybe just like this, the Blazers aren't very good. And instead of chasing this season and, and, and going all in to, you know, make these trades and, and, and do these things, or even just, just going all in period to, you know, be a playoff team and get into the play in tournament and finish eighth and get, you know, rocked, rocked out of the playoffs by the jazz or whatever it might be, or the warriors um, that maybe you're better off heading into the summer with CJ McCollum still on the roster and a lottery pick. And maybe that's when you can get your most value for CJ McCollum. Um, you know, again, deadline spur actions, but teams are much more likely to sort of retool and, and have different priorities when you get to the summertime. I'm starting to lean that way. This isn't, I'm not saying that you maximize Damon Lord by tanking. And I, I wanted to use that T word because that has also come up in several listener emails. I'm just saying it might be time to admit what you are. And that's not a very good team that needs a drastic overhaul, a, a, like a, to a, a reimagining, if you will, to use some sort of uh, brand terminology. But perhaps that reimagining is best done in the summertime. It's best done in July and entering free agency when when teams' priorities change and when the Blazers have something that w- would be desirable, which is that lottery pick in hand, the rights to a to a lottery draft pick. Say the Blazers, you know, enter the lottery and end up with something like the seventh pick in the draft. The seventh pick plus CJ is a lot more valuable then than it is ne- then sort of like CJ on his own right now and um, you know loosening protections on the pick owed to Chicago, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, for those of you scoring at home, the Blazers owe the Bulls a, a lottery protected pick that's lottery protected through 2028, which means if the Blazers do make the playoffs, they keep, um, the Bulls would get their pick. But if the Blazers miss the playoffs and are a lottery team, Portland would keep their pick. So you'd have to lift those protections, give the Chicago an unprotected pick. And that's dicey. I wouldn't, I personally, I wouldn't want to do that for as mediocre as the Blazers are right now. Um, mediocre to bad. Like I've seen the records bad, but they're really shorthanded. Like things can change, uh, obviously. So I think where we've landed using the idea that Tom Ziller offered us and the sort of the physical uh, parameters that Danny Morang offered us and the ideas from Owen and Scott and courtside Kev is like the Blazers should look to make the way to maximize Damon Lord is with length and athleticism. The way to do that is to maybe take some sort of talent step back, which is like a, uh, uh, Karis LeVert, Gordon Hayward, Harrison Barnes, right? Like where you're getting a worse player in return, but a different shape. I think that's that's how to maximize Dame because because size and length is 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 going to be what you'd rather have next to Damian Lord. You've got Norman Powell on, on the roster for um, a while. You can bring back Anthony Simons. Like if you need other guards, that's the thing you have more of. Um, so the way to maximize Dame, but also might be to admit that this season, as, as listener Scott pointed out, is, is a lost season and go into the summer, you know, t- don't tank, but just keep losing because you're no good. You don't have to shut guys down, but just let it, let, let the momentum be what it be. If you believe in that, like let, let the sort of season run its course, be a bad team, get that, keep your draft pick, keep CJ McCollum and try again in July. The way to sort of the, the path forward for the Blazers is not necessarily to tear it all down now is what I'm trying to get to is like that explore the market, find, find your length, find your, find your athleticism. If that doesn't come, you do, you do not have to just make trades and make trades. You can wait until the summertime to do it. You maximize Dame by adding length, adding shooting and, and, 
and just moving forward with vets that can help. I don't think you load up on draft picks. Like if you're trying to maximize the next two or three years, you want adults who can win in the league. Um, and you might want adults that on paper look a little bit worse, but having more dudes who are six foot eight, Max to Damian Lillard gets you there. Here's where I've landed on sort of what I would try to craft if I were the Blazers is a new age version of the 2012 Chicago Bulls with Damian Lillard as Derrick Rose. Try to build an elite defensive team as best you can. Not a, not easier said than done. Like I, I, I went through sort of a trade, matri- trade machine journey and I didn't exactly build myself like a elite defensive team. I think you can make little upgrades, but it's hard to know. But an elite defensive team where maybe you lose some of your firepower and say, you know, we'll let sort of Dame plus a little bit of modern 2021 version of the Bulls shooting is like, um, we'll get you there. I think I think that's the path forward is a, is a really a, a team that is above average in defense and relies on Dame more on offense, as opposed to a team that's elite on offense and kind of still can't figure it out on defense as they built now. The roster looks more like that it's just how do you get there and my sort of thinking is do your best to get there at the trade deadline in february that's february 10th if you can't get there you got to tra- you probably have to trade roko and yusuf nurkic by february 10th to sort of follow my path right if you you trade them you get whatever you can get in return and you make your you, you keep it moving but you do not have to trade cj mccollum then you can go into the summer and, and and there's perhaps more value in trading cj mccollum once you get to draft day but just think that the reasoning has to be like the getting the most out of dame needs better defenders more size more athleticism i really think um you know some sort of vertical spacing and more size on the wings that alone could help Dame. And I think he can be an offensive force in and of himself. You add him and Norm on the court, you're going to be a decent offensive team. You just need to be also an above average defensive team to get there, which is why you've, you, you need to make some sort of um, just stylistic upgrades. That's my, that's my pitch for maximizing Dame. Not a ton of specifics because um, I think sort of just going down the deep rabbit hole into hypotheticals is, is less valuable than thinking about sort of the, the larger philosophy behind how to do it. So this is sort of my philosophy for how to maximize the next two to three years of Damien Lord. Don't go too fast. Don't panic. You don't have to get it all in July, but you do have to make some moves over the next six weeks to get there. You probably do have to trade the expiring contracts of Robert Covington and Yusuf Nurkic to get there, but you don't have to trade every single other part of the roster. You can be somewhat patient, but this season you might have to admit is a lost one. That's how you maximize Dame. You do not chase the playoffs now. You chase next. You you have to be as good as you can possibly be. You know, November of next season. That's that's how you maximize and sort of respect Damon Lord's wishes and abilities to go ahead and do this right here in Portland. What I want to do to close the show. Let's talk a little bit about what's next for the Blazers. We'll move back into the present. The sort the semi present and look ahead to a challenging uh, January head and the latest sort of notes for what's what's head, what's upcoming with the team. So join me there in the third segment. Still a pass first point guard. Still Mike Richmond. Still listen to Locked On Blazers. We talked about how to maximize game. Now let's let's talk about what's coming up, what's going on with your Portland Trailblazers. Um, on Monday evening, they begin a four-game homestand. They play the Atlanta Hawks, the Miami Heat, the Cleveland Cavaliers, and the Sacramento Kings. At one point, what probably looked like um, a chance for the Blazers to get get some wins um, is, you know, nothing is certain with this team. I'm recording this on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, the Blazers have not re- released their official injury report, but according to Shams Charania, Anthony Simons is expected to be back for the game against the Atlanta Hawks after three days in uh, the health and safety protocols. Sounds like Simon's tested in and then tested out two back to back negative tests in 48 hours gets you out of the protocols. Welcome back. And only, only missing one game. Chauncey Billups expected back on the sideline and also according to Shams Trani of ESPN, uh, but according or of, excuse me, of the athletic whoops. Um, but uh, Scott Brooks is reportedly in health and safety protocols. The acting head coach for the Blazers last three games is he's out. Billups is it, Billups is back in the sidelines and, and, uh, Scott Brooks is is into the health and safety protocols. It's just the sort of roulette of our times. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but the Blazers will have some players available. There's a chance that other guys get back. Um, obviously, we'll talk about it when it happens, but at, that is the information I have available to me. So, and, and 
more than just like previewing the Hawks who have de- who are dealing with their own um, protocols and aren't going to have coach Nate McMillan on the sidelines. They're going to have an acting head coach in the sidelines uh, for that game Monday night. Like this homestand has some, if, if the Blazers are going to sort of keep, keep afloat. And again, I, I might be over them keeping afloat at this point. I don't think the wins and losses matter. Um, I think what they do with the roster becomes is almost more important than the, um, than the wins and losses because they're not, um, even if they turn it around, their ceiling is relatively limited. They, they, have put themselves in a position where they're much more likely to start thinking about next year. But for the sake of this podcast, which is a daily podcast, wherever you get, wherever available, wherever you already get podcasts and also on YouTube, like we can talk about the present, um, you know, four game homestand after this four game homestand, which will wrap up next week when I'm recording this, this time next week, they'll, be, they'll have played the Sacramento Kings. They will have just 17 home games remaining, uh, compared to 26 road games and they'll close out January with nine of 11 on the road after this four game homestand beginning with the with a season long six game roadie that begins next week um this is not like it's not like put up or shut up time like I I, I think we've kind of done that on this podcast in the past and said like now is the time for the Blazers to prove themselves or whatever um I don't I don't think that's we're not there anymore we're beyond that this team's just not good enough to sort of be in put up or shut up time this is like if you want to stay within shouting distance you January will decide whether you can whether you sink or whether you swim and swim is like stay within the range for a, for a late season push to get one of the last playoff spots. It is not like finish fourth in the West anymore. It's not, um, it's not even like probably avoid the play in at this point, certainly, certainly within the realm that they avoid the plan because the rest of the West is bad and there's injuries all over the, 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 sp- all over sort of the, the conference. But, um, you know, we've watched the same team. I don't like, I just don't, I don't see them, even if they're back healthy, making just a a massive push without, without trades. And I think that the trades can be more, I would rather the trades be more forward looking than sort of like immediately address their needs. Now, best case scenario is it's both, right? You trade for Pascal Siakam and you're like really good because you've added an all-star wing to the roster, but I don't think it's that simple. So instead of like putting instead of saying like this four game, you know, the Blazers have to go at least two and two in this four game homestand to give themselves a chance. I think the reality is more like this team's pretty shorthanded. And by the end of January, we will know the truth, which is that they're not going to be competitive for a playoff spot, or I'll look like a big dumb dummy. Like I'm, I'm comfortable being wrong. I'm comfortable admitting I'm wrong in this space. Um, I, I appreciate the feedback, right? Like I will, I will eat crow or, or whatever. Like I've, I will, I will say that I'm wrong when I'm wrong, but like uh, this team doesn't look like a playoff team. And I think January is going to cement that. And then when we get to the end of January, we'll have 10 days before the, um, before the trade deadline and the Blazers will kind of um, both their season and their future will get decided. They're not going to trade Damian Lillard. He's still part of the future. That's why we spent the first part of the show talking about maximizing what you can get from Dame. But when you, as we continue to sort of zoom out and I've, I've moved the lens from like a two, three year window where it's like, get some, you know, get some, add some length, add some, like some look, look around the league for some sort of tradable type wings, the Karis Leverts, Harrison Barnes, Gordon Haywards, um, Kelly Oubre's and my dream world, Jonathan Isaacs, like look for those as opposed to that. But like, just look at January, look at it you know, bring the lens in a little bit. Look at January, like, you know, nine of 11, they've been a terrible road team and just bad team in general, nine of 11 on the road to to close January. And these four games that they have at home, um, you know, depending on the availability of, uh, of guys for Miami and Cleveland, like look like one in three to, to wrap up this, this homestand. And what I want to tell you here, is like, there's no reason to freak out anymore. We've got, we've gone into the deep end beyond freaking out. Like, um, the reality when thinking about this team and considering what's next needs to be sort of, um, it needs to be with a wider scope. Uh, I'm not saying these games won't matter. I'm still going to do recaps of these games and talk about the basketball stuff as it happens. Um, it just like, I think the season has come to reality where you have to start thinking about the future, be it um, six weeks from now or six months from now for this Blazers team, because you've got to, you've got to 
do your, you've got to put yourself in a position to be a competitive basketball team next season. I don't think the Blazers are that far away, but I think this season is starting to slip away. So maybe you, you do turn your focus there. I'm not calling for an all out tank. I'm just saying January looks pretty hard. And then by the time you get to February, you kind of have to decide what you are. I think the Blazers over the next over the next month, it's January 2nd as I'm recording this, but over the next, you know, 29 days, they will tell us who they are, both by how they play on the court. You know, if they win five out of six on that sixth game on the road, I will, first of all, how fun would that be? <laughs> a good, good, a good, great place road trip, right? Um, almost tripling the number of road wins they have right now. And if they were to go five and one, um, they would, uh, you know, we will, we will recalibrate, right? But I think where we are now and sort of giving an honest, look at this team is like, let's start thinking about what's next and maximizing your two to three year window with Damian Lord. You, you're going to want to take some swings. Eventually you're going to strike out taking those swings. But I think you, if Dame wants to be here, you owe it to him to take those swings. Those things change, but he's made it really clear that he wants to be in Portland. And I think the team, for the most part, has made it very clear that they want him to be in Portland. So instead of talking about um, whether it's pragmatic to trade Dame and start all over, I think you can have that conversation down the road. For now, you look and you say, January is going to be really tough. Even this four-game homestand, there's no gimmies that you see on the schedule. So what this team's going to be and what they, what they might be has to be defined by what they do off the court and what the front office does to retool this team. Because as currently constructed, as we sit here today, these games don't seem particularly meaningful. What's particularly meaningful is whatever they do next. And whatever they do next needs to be adding length, adding real forwards on the roster, like NBA level threes and fours to complement Dame. You've got enough twos. Ben McLemore is an awesome basketball player, but when he's your fifth best guard, um, his value as just a straight up shooter is diminished. Build a roster that makes more sense around Damian Lillard. That's the task for the Blazers. And it literally begins now where it's already started and I'm catching it midstream. They got to do something. Because the present is not great, and the future is a relatively narrow window. These next couple years are probably the best you'll get out of Damian Lillard. And you, I think this team just, uh, the franchise, um, you know, without using the big L word of loyalty, like the franchise, if a player as good as him wants to be here, they owe it to him to go ahead and try to be as good as possible. And that has to start over these next six weeks. It's, it's the off-court stuff will define what's next for this Blazers era, or, or we will have that conversation about maybe it's time to tear it down. I'm not, a, I'm not in tank mode. I'm not in tear down mode. I'm just in realist mode. The Blazers have to change up something. And the something has to be forward looking because what they're like into the future over the next two, three seasons is way more important over what they're like over a challenging end of January. That's going to do it for today's show. Thanks for listening. Tell your friends that they can find us on YouTube. They can find us wherever they get podcasts. Just search Locked on Blazers and we will be right there waiting for you. People hear about podcasts by word of mouth. So if you enjoy the show, tell your friends that they might as well. Like I said, just search for Locked on Blazers and you'll find us. Appreciate you listening. Talk to you soon.